Hey, Wargamers, Today Games Workshop continued their week-long preview of the new Tau Codex by revealing the new Tactical Philosophies special rule. Now, these philosophies are named after the two major doctrines that Tau follow on the battlefield, Monka and Kao Yun, and they impose some really powerful benefits depending on which one you select. Uh, if you select Maka, it benefits you early game. If you select Kao Yun, it benefits you late game. And those two divergent philosophies uh, provide the basis for this rule that you select uh, at the beginning of the game, or rather right after you determine turn order. So you know who's going to go first, basically. Um, and that's a really valuable time to be able to make this decision because you know who your opponent is, you know what their army is, you know what the board is going to look like. And so uh, being able to select this particular philosophy, uh, either Maka or Kao Yan, depending on all that information allows you to uh, plan your deployment with it in mind and uh, hopefully achieve a particular strategy uh, that is adaptable, right? You can change the way you deploy your army. You can change the way you play your army based on the information you have at that point in the game and could strongly influence the outcome of that game, right? Like having the ability to select between these two pretty powerful abilities, depending on who your opponent is, is really valuable. And there's a really high potential here for both of them to be equally effective, depending on what's in the rest of the codex. It's hard to judge these in a vacuum because we don't know how other units might benefit from them necessarily, and we especially don't know how other units or rules might interact or augment these different tactical philosophies. So um, hopefully there are ways to uh, enhance these or change them in a way that makes both of them equally viable depending on your army composition. We'll have to wait and find out. But as it is, these look like they could be very useful, very strong tools for the Tau Empire going into this 9th edition codex. It's not necessarily an army-wide special rule, right? Like, I, it kind of seems like this is something like in the vein of sacred rights for Sisters of Battle, uh, that you have to have the tactical philosophies special rule in order to actually benefit from them. Uh, and so, you know, which units are is that going to be? Uh, probably not every unit in the Codex, right? Things like Crude, Best Bit, I wouldn't be surprised if they didn't have it. Drones maybe aren't going to have it. Maybe some vehicles aren't going to have it. We'll have to to wait and find out. Uh, let me know what you think in the comments below if you have a if you have an idea of which ones are going to benefit from this or not. Um, but yeah, I would I wouldn't be surprised if our auxiliaries are again left in the dust in this particular uh, rule set. And then finally, it does raise the question of what happens to Master of War. Master of War is ability that commanders have right now that allow them to call. Uh, a different ability. They can call Kao Yun or Mon Ka in a totally different form, and that shares the same name with, with Tactical Philosophy. So you can't have two rules with the same name, so are they just going to reword Master of War to, to do something different, um, or is it going to be completely gone? I really hope that commanders retain some sort of support utility like Master of War, even if it is, you know, very different than the current iteration. So uh, I'm eager to see what they do with the commanders in order to give them that command ability, aside from just being a, a better crisis suit, right? So they, they they have to do something, especially for Shadow Sun and Farsight, which have the ability to call Kao Yun uh, or Mon Ka, respectively, after Master of War has already been called once in the game. And so those are are massive benefits to bring either of those characters. It's one of the main reasons why we bring either Shadow Sun or Farsight in a list is because they allow us access to two Master of War calls. And if this is turned into something that's just a, a persistent rule that you select at the beginning of the game, that significantly reduces the value of either of those special characters. So they probably have to have some other big benefit, some big you know, change to their rules that make them still an attractive option or or make them at least, you know, a shadow of what they used to be um, in terms of utility. So I have some ideas that we'll talk about in just a moment about what I think might happen to Shao Sen and Farsight with this regard, but hopefully they get a little bit of attention and uh, are able to interact with tactical philosophies in exciting and powerful ways.
All right, and then so depending on which tactical philosophy you pick, you get access to two special rules. Uh, for Mon Ka, those special rules are active turns one through three, or rather battle rounds one through three. Uh, and it says that each time this unit makes a normal move or advances in your movement phase until the end of your shooting phase, it counts as having remained stationary. It says also that each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack that targets the closest eligible enemy unit within the range shown in the table below, improve the armor penetration characteristic of that attack by one and re-roll a wound roll of one. Uh, and then the, the table is that in battle round one, the range is 18 inches and in battle round two, it's 12 inches and in battle round three, it's nine inches. So clearly a very powerful tool for a lot of different Tau army compositions. Um, a few things to pick out here. One is that it's a reducing bubble, right? Hopefully you were able to pick up on that. Uh, you go from 18 to 12 to 9. And that range, those range bands mean that uh, range of your weapons is potentially less influential uh, for a Monka army, right? Like you're using Monka that has a maximum range of 18, 12, or 9 inches, which means that you are going to be wanting to shoot at that range. And so if you have a range 30 inch gun, uh, it doesn't necessarily mean anything different to you than having a range 24 inch gun if you're trying to shoot at something that's only nine inches away right so range is less important positioning is more important uh right so positioning and speed are favored by manka uh, so things that can either move fast or arrive in a particular location quickly are going to be favored by manka the thing is though about Manta Strike or other abilities that allow you to, you know, arrive mid battle is that there is a constraint on when you can actually use those. You can't use those turn one. So, uh, having, uh, a Manta Strike based army with Manka is good, right? If, if you're coming in turn two, uh, but, but actually pretty hard to, to make happen, right? You really are, are rewarded for having just a fast army, one that's either, you know, in transports or or inherently fast, not something that's arriving mid-battle via a deep strike mechanic, uh, because you're actually not going to have that much time to benefit from this, and you are going to have a hard time actually getting in the right uh, range band as well. So there's a trade-off here between the the positioning and durability awarded to you by Manta Striking and the actual utility you're going to be getting from Manka uh, if you do that. So that's something that you'll have to consider very carefully. And, um, and you know, I think it's probably going to come out in favor of having just like crisis suits um, or other units start off on the board and just, you know, run, run towards the, the enemy in the, in a way that makes this um, an, a strategic uh, application of, of force. The other thing about this rule is that it, it basically is better for weaker units um, or weaker guns, at least. So um, it's always useful, right? It's always useful to be able to um, improve your AP by one and reroll wound rolls of one and count as stationary. Um, but it's not always meaningful, right? So if you have like a fusion blaster, AP minus four, having that extra you know, bit of AP is not really a, a, a useful thing. You know, even if you're shooting at a, something with an armor save of two, uh, you're pushing it to a six natively and then would be to a seven or, or, you know, basically remove that save with a plus five. But, you know, a lot, for one thing, a lot of things have a invulnerable save, so they're, they're not going to care. Um, but also the difference between a, a six and a, a non-existent save is, you know, pretty minor. Compare that to something that's a minus one going to a minus two, you get a lot more utility. You get a, a much larger proportional increase in damage output because of that. And that's true for uh, wound rolls as well, right? So if you're, you know, hitting, if you're wounding on threes and moving to twos, that's a smaller proportional benefit than moving from wounding on fives to wounding on fours. Um, so you get a lot more bang for your buck out of those high volume of fire, weaker weaponry. Uh, that that you're not going to necessarily load up on fusion blasters if you're taking them on Ka, but instead you're going to be taking a lot of volume of fire stuff that is going to benefit more from this early game. And so I think 
This is a huge benefit to things like strike teams in Devilfish, um, right? Like, especially if Fireblades keep Volley Fire in some form uh, that they have now, uh, being able to take a strike team that already now has a minus one AP, boosting that to minus two. Um, and if we're benefiting from volume fire, sh- firing three shots at 15 inches um, on turn one, you know, load them up in a Delphish, drive them up the board, unload on an objective, and then just let the <laughs> let the pulse weaponry, weaponry uh, fly because that is a ton of really high quality shots. Right, strength five minus two AP, three shots per fire warrior at fifteen inch range, uh, is really good. I, th- I think um, so. I would I would be surprised if strike teams and devilfish or like a fish of fury type of approach isn't facilitated by this rule change. Um, additionally, battle suits are going to love this. Right, being able to count as remaining stationary after advancing on turn one means that they can get all those high power weaponry um, up the board really quickly. Uh, you can advance with your battle suits, which already move eight inches, plus you know whatever you roll for your advance, and then you know, the first range band is 18 inches. So you're getting, you know, most of your crisis suit weapons within that range, um, right, right away. So that's, that's awesome, right? It synergizes really well for crisis suits. Um, stealth suits, I think see a lot of benefit here, uh, because both of them can carry a lot of weapons and, uh, and move pretty quickly. So battle suits, uh, are certainly favored by Maka. And then what does this mean for Farsight? Um, I would I would hope that maybe Farsight allows Monka to last the whole game, right? So you you go from 18 to 12 to 9, but then just stays at 9 for turns 4 and 5. I think that'd be a really cool way to allow Farsight to still have a lot of utility, um, maybe too much utility uh, if, you, if you're still um, getting this benefit for the entire game, but something like that. Or maybe, you know, says the, the turn counts as one less than, than its actual count. So it lasts till turn four only, something like that. Um, I think that'd be really cool as a way to, to make Farsight relevant given this change to how Mon Ka works. And then the alternate choice you can make is to select Cao Yun, which is active through rounds three, four, and five, and it says that a unit benefiting from Cao Yun is eligible to shoot in a turn in which it fell back, but if it does, then until the end of the next turn, each time a model in this unit makes a range attack, subtract one from that attack roll, or from that attack's hit roll. So you can fall back and shoot, but you have minus one to hit. Not a bad uh, trade-off compared to uh, the status quo. And then each time a model in this unit makes a ranged attack that targets the closest eligible enemy unit within 12 inches, if that model is not within engagement range of any enemy units and did not fall back this turn on on an unmodified hit roll of the value shown in the table below, if that attack scores a hit, it scores one additional hit. So on battle round three, if you hit on a six, you get an additional hit. If you hit uh, on a five up on turn four, you get an additional hit. If you hit up a on a four or higher on battle round five, you get an additional hit. So um, that is a huge boost to power to any uh, thing that's remaining at the end of the game. Um, and so Cao Yun really favors durability. You really want to avoid the early charge. I mean, you, that's always been true. You always want to avoid the early charge, but especially with Cao Yun, because you want to save those models until they can benefit from Cao Yun. So if you're going to get charged turn two, you would really much rather have that happen on turn three so you can fall back and shoot, um, right? So you don't have to go through that extra turn of combat, um, right? So having that that ability to avoid that early charge, either by like screening or or just running away or whatever, um, is going to be benefited or promoted by Cao Yun. Um, it also means that if that's the case, you need to have some additional tool for early scoring, right? If you're playing really cagey at the beginning of the game because you want to wait, you want to keep as many things alive to benefit from Cao Yun, that means that you need something to happen in turns one and two um, to get some points on the board. Uh, and so to, it, that might be sacrificial units, right? You might have some 
some kind of small token units that you're throwing out there in order to to try to score something, um, kind of pulling double duty of scoring and screening. Um, or there might be something else that the army has in this new codex that facilitates that process. Like maybe drones are going to be even more important for Cao Yun armies if they offer some sort of durability. You know, you can still get stuck in in combat, but if you can shift wounds to drones or otherwise benefit from, from, benefit from saver protocols in a way that gives you the longevity to make it to turn three or four or five, then that's going to be something too, right? Like so long as you make it is the point. So Cao Yun is going to be kind of a desperate army for turns one and two. And then turn three, they're like, all right, we're here to play game. (laughs) You know, Um, it also means that uh, you have the fallback and shoot ability, right? Um, and this is something we have been asking for, we've been hoping for, uh, for a long time for Tau, is the ability to you know get out of combat and shoot. With the uh, loss of the fly keyword, Tau really were hurting. So rather the way that the fly keyword used to work, uh, Tau were really hurting. And so having the ability to fall back and shoot and have it not just be you know, jetpack units, but also, you know, anything that benefits from tactical philosophy is really good. Um, and that means that you suffer a much lower penalty for assault uh, or being assaulted, I guess, um, under this tactical philosophy in the second half of the game, which is really awesome because it allows you to sit on those objectives, um, get the points from them. And then when you get charged, you can just back up, shoot and, you know, go on with your your business because you'll actually you know be able to clear things off the board much more effectively and have a much lower risk associated with actually going for those objectives Uh, so that's a really powerful tool just on its own Um, yes it's at minus one to hit which if you're hitting on fours already it's a big loss Uh, but hopefully there's ways to enhance ballistic skill in this codex that that help mitigate that a little bit um, maybe maybe there are some special rules, like for particular characters, that might mean that you don't actually have to pay this penalty. Like maybe Dark Strider, for example, will allow you to ignore the minus one to hit if you fall back. That'd be nice. Um, the additional hit special rule is um, is really awesome uh, if you can make it to turn five. Right? If you make it to turn five. Uh, an un- unmodified hit roll of four up gives you an additional hit, which for most how is going to be most of their hits. So, so you're basically doubling the output of any given weapon on turn five, if you can live that long. So uh, that's really awesome. That means things like broadsides, riptides, ghost kills, stealth suits. Uh, I think they mentioned the the stealth options in that in the article actually but things that are able to stick around for the end of the game are going to get better and better uh, as the game goes on which uh is great because a lot of those units particularly riptides their big strength right now is being able to stay on the on the tabletop and so them getting even stronger as the game goes on is is very useful the only thing is that it's it's uh you know backloaded right so if you're if you're getting the crap beat out of you for turns one two three and maybe four having a really awesome turn five might might be enough but it's going to be an uphill battle right like you really have to mitigate the damage done to you at the first half of the game in order to make cow young count um and and that's that might be really hard for a lot of people, depending on what the codex actually has in it. So this is where I say there's the potential for for Cao Yun to be equally good as Mon Ka. I think just judging these things as they are, Mon Ka seems like the stronger pick, but it's going to be context dependent. It's going to depend on who you're facing, what the board looks like. It's also going to depend on what's in your army, of course. And and so all things equal, I, I tend to think that Cao Yun looks a little bit weaker, but but if the codex is built in a way that actually facilitates Cao Yun and allows it to, to shine, then, then the, there really could be something special here too and really make it an option, right? Not, not making it a trick, but making it an option where you really could go with either of these 
and adjust your play style in a way that makes either of them work. And that's what I'm hoping to see. So I'm, I'm optimistic. I'm eager to see what it means uh, when we actually get the codex in hand because this looks like it could be really cool. Um, and then finally, of course, what's the deal with Shao Sun? Well, you know, you might not be surprised. I said Farsight might just extend the tactical philosophy for a couple turns. Maybe Shao Sun makes it makes Kao Yun start a little earlier, right? So maybe you you get it on turn one um, or turn two, or it means that the the current battle round counts as you know one earlier than than what it actually is, or, or one later, I guess. <laughs> right. So if you're on battle round one, you would count it as battle round two. So Kao Yun would start on turn two as opposed to turn three something like that. Uh, I think that would be really, really cool um, and really valuable because it allows you to play Kao Yun the entire game as opposed to having to wait um, until the end. I know that that's kind of the theme of Kao Yun, but still, like, if you're able to just in- embrace the Kao Yun a little bit more throughout the game, I think that would be good. So uh, let me know what you think in the comments below. Do you have a favorite? Do you like Mon Khan more? Do you like Kao Yun more? Which one are you going to lean towards in your army design? Put it in the comments below. And as always, thanks for watching and happy wargaming. Hey everyone, thanks for watching. A while ago I made my own miniature and if you too want to be the proud owner of an invasive wargaming model, you can check out the link in the description below. Down there you will also find links for the invasive wargaming discord server and the invasive wargaming patreon. Really this channel wouldn't be possible without the support of my patrons. Special thanks to Marcy, A Little Pink Monster, Benaby Jones, Durza, Ever Keller, Robbie Goodwin, Jose Gomez, Ruger, Drew Pratley, Michael Byrne, Zealous Brimstone, Scott Heater, Stephen Cowan, Jared Egler, Chris Kessler, and Tao Oswell.